so uh, this talk uh, is uh, an introductory talk uh, in the area of fractals and fractal dimensions so uh, i have made a few slides and i wanted to write in between but uh, somehow my ipad i am not able to share the screen so let let me start so oh, here is a brief abstract uh, for the talk so this talk aims to give a brief introduction to the area of fractals and fractal dimensions so we'll talk about uh, what are hausdorff measures hausdorff dimension box counting dimension packing dimension etc and we'll see some examples and uh, maybe in the end i'll try to give some uh, like recent uh, research directions so let me start with uh, in the main question is like what, what are fractals so oh, this thing, uh, uh, this term fractal, this was coined by a Mandel brought in 1975. So he based it on the uh, Latin word fractus meaning the broken or fractured. So uh, he defined uh, uh, in the beginning, he defined a fractal to be a set whose Hausdorff dimension strictly exceeds its topological dimension. So we'll come and see what uh, this Hausdorff dimension means. Uh, topological dimension some of you might have seen in topology so uh, uh, it is important to note that uh, topological dimension is uh, always a non-negative integer whereas this hausdorff dimension it can be non-integer also so he defined fractal to be a set whose hausdorff dimension strictly exceeds this topological dimension but then like many sets uh, which uh, should be considered as fractals so uh, this was not true so later he simplified and expanded the definition to a fractal is a shape made up of parts similar to the whole in some way so again we'll explain this thing there is something called self similarity for fractals so we will see that uh, with examples so th this is what uh, he defined but again like uh, uh, this also did not cover uh, all the things which we would like to call fractal. So later uh, Mandelbrot proposed to use this term fractal without a pedantic definition. So to use and to use fractal dimension as a generic term applicable to all the variants. So when we say fractal dimension, there are many different kinds of fractal dimension. And uh, <coughs> We will discuss some of them. So like this Hausdorff dimension is the one such thing. So when people call fractal dimension, one has to like know what they are referring to. So, oh, and fractals, uh, many, many mathematicians now believe that um, uh, there's no like mathematical definition for fractal. And uh, there are some like underlying properties which we are interested in. And if uh, something satisfied those properties, then we can call fractal. And uh, they, um, the set may not satisfy all the e properties. So, so uh, what what are some of the properties that I um, mean uh, we think a fractal should satisfy? So, I mean here I, I could not put the pictures and all, but uh, let let me. He like uh, give some examples which uh, many of you may be familiar with and then uh, tell uh, some properties which this fractal uh, is uh, supposed to satisfy so w one thing is like this uh, it is made up of parts similar to the whole in some way so oh, let, let me start with uh, I, I wanted to like describe these things here. So oh, oh, the first example will be of Cantor set. So oh, this Cantor, Cantor middle third set, uh, this should be familiar to most of you. So how do we define a Cantor set? So we start with uh, a unit interval. Uh, so oh yeah, I, I wanted to like uh, uh, write something here, but uh, uh, let, let me just uh, describe it. So the Cantor set, uh, the way it is uh, constructed, you start with the uh, unit interval, and then uh, you divide it into 
three parts and then you remove the middle one third open interval so in the beginning we have uh, uh, let's call e0 to be the unit interval 0 1 and then e1 will be after removing the middle one third open interval so e1 is the closed interval 0 to 1 by 3 union with 2 by 3 to 1 and then we repeat this process so then from each of the uh, intervals we remove the middle one third so e2 will be the union of four intervals each of sides uh, one ninth so zero one ninth and then one nine to two ninth is removed but then two nine to one third is there so oh, this way uh, we can construct en for any natural number n so en will be a union of uh, uh, 2 to the power n in a closed interval, each of length 1 by 3 to the n. Right? And then Cantor set, uh, this is defined as uh, the intersection of en when we vary n from 0 to infinity. Right? So in this case, so you can see that uh, this is a nested, uh, each en plus 1 is contained in en. And uh, uh, so oh, this this is a well known uh, set. Uh, this Cantor uh, he introduced this set, and uh, also he showed that uh, this uh, set is actually an uncountable set. So what what are some properties of this Cantor set? So so one thing is that uh, this is uh, uncountable, and uh, uh, if you are familiar with Lebesgue measure, so if you uh, calculate the Lebesgue measure of this set. So oh, that turns out to be zero. That is very easy to see by just adding the intervals which are removed from the unit interval. And then uh, if you uh, sum that infinite series, then you will see that the uh, sum of the length of the intervals which are removed turns out to be one. And therefore, uh, the Cantor set is of Lebesgue measure zero. So oh, in the sense of Lebesgue measure, this is a very small set but uh, this is still an uncountable set and there are some other properties like this is a totally disconnected set so this Cantor set uh, this uh, is an example of what uh, are known as fractals so oh, let's uh, try to like uh, see what uh, some properties of this Cantor set is so if you look at uh, this Cantor set so Cantor set is after like we take uh, the infinite intersection the countable intersection then we get Cantor set so oh this is made up of uh, two pieces if we uh, look at let's call e to be the Cantor set and then uh, we can look at e intersected with the closed interval 0 to 1 by 3 and e intersected with uh, the interval uh, from uh, 2 by 3 to 1 so E is exactly equal to the intersection of, uh, sorry, the disjoint union of these two, two sets, which is E intersection with uh, 0, 1 third and E intersected with uh, 2 third to 1. So it is made up of two parts and each of the parts actually you see is similar to the original Cantor set. So, oh, so if you for example, if you take uh, the E intersected with 0 to 1 by 3, and if you scale it by a factor of 3, then you will get the original Cantor set, right? Similarly, the other part E intersected with 2 third to 1, if you would translate it uh, to the left and then you scale it again, you will get. So oh, these are like uh, similar to the original thing. and. Uh, if you see in that, uh, it, the same pattern is repeated. So oh, this is uh, the uh, self-similarity that uh, many of the fractals uh, they display. Right? So oh, another thing is that uh, you see that uh, this is uh, uh, this Cantor set. It cannot be described in the usual like uh, using the usual geometry what, what i mean by that is that uh, you cannot like write this set as uh, say locus of points satisfying some algebraic equation or something so the usual uh, like uh, geometric objects like 
circles and parabola and these things you can describe as the, the locus of points satisfying certain equations but uh, this cantor set uh, it is not like that there is some kind of fine structure there and then uh, at uh, i mean uh, you know, also oh, you see that uh, it is the like i said already uncountable set but uh, its length is zero length meaning the lebesgue measure of this set is zero uh, so oh, th these are certain properties of this and uh, many fractals also will satisfy so the the next example le, we can consider in r2 in the plane so oh, this is called this a serpinski gasket so what is serpinski gasket so here we start with uh, an equilateral triangle so suppose we take an equilateral triangle and then you join the midpoints of the three sides of the equilateral triangle so then this equilateral triangle le, is now union of four equilateral triangles and each of uh, diameter half of the original one so you look at uh, the equilateral triangle and then join the midpoints then you see that the size size not in terms of area in terms of diameter i am seeing so then it becomes uh, uh, half the diameter of the original equilateral triangle so then what we do we have like four uh, equilateral triangle we remove the middle one so then the equilateral triangle is made up of uh, three uh, this uh, now oh, at the uh, second stage it is made up of union of three equilateral triangles each of diameter half of maybe i'll show some picture from the net so that will be easier okay so let, let's see this so so initially we have uh, this uh, uh, equilateral triangle and then we, we join the midpoint and then remove this uh, middle one so then we have union of three equilateral triangles each of diameter half of the original one then from each of these three equilateral triangles we again uh, do the same thing join the midpoints and then remove the middle of this triangle so all these like white parts these are the parts which are removed from the original equilateral triangle and then when we repeat this process infinitely often then uh, what is left is the it's called the serpinski gasket so uh, again here also oh, you can uh, try to find what is the lebesgue measure of uh, this uh, serpinski triangle so oh, by adding the area of the uh, triangles which are removed from this you will see that uh, the Lebesgue measure turns out to be zero. But this again uh, is an uncountable set uh, that also one can prove. And here also we have the self similarity feature. So you see uh, that uh, this uh, whole Sierpinski triangle is made up of uh, three parts and each are similar to the original one scaled by a factor of half. So in the Cantor set, it was uh, two parts scaled by a factor of uh, one by three. Here we have uh, three parts scaled by a factor of uh, one by two. And you can actually find the uh, maps also. So later we'll discuss about iterated function system. So oh, you see, one can take, uh, suppose this is equilateral triangle where this vertex is uh, the origin, then uh, if you take the map uh, from r2 to r2 where uh, x comma y goes to half of x comma y then you will get uh, this triangle the leftmost triangle 
and then uh, you can translate that to get uh, this one and again you can translate this triangle to get this so this is made up of like three the parts and each part is like uh, image of an affine linear transformation on r2 where the e, this uh, scaling factor is strictly less than one so this is serpinski triangle uh, next uh, example is what is known as Koch curve. So this Koch curve again, let me show a picture. Okay, let's see this picture. Sorry. Yeah, so uh, let, let us see this picture. So uh, this initially we take uh, uh, a line segment. Let's say this is of length one. And then at the next stage, what we do, we divide this line segment into three equal parts. And then uh, from the middle part, we remove that middle line segment and replace it by uh, two sides of equilateral triangle with base on that so oh, we have initially say the interval from 0 to 1 then we have this line segment from 0 to 1 by 3 and the line segment from 2 by 3 to 1 and then we introduce two more line segments of length uh, again 1 by 3 each so at the next stage we have this union of four line segments each of length 1 by 3 and then from each of these four line segments, we again repeat the same process that we replace the middle one third by a, the other two sides of the equilateral triangle based on that. So oh, at the next stage, E2 will be, we have this one replaced by a, this four line segment. Similarly, this line segment will be replaced by four line segments like this and this one and this one so then here we will get four into four so four square line segments and each of length one by nine and then we can repeat this process so oh, each of these things you see is a continuous curve and then in in the limit this converges to again a continuous curve which is called the Koch curve so this Koch curve is the limiting curve of uh, this uh, sequence of curves. So, <coughs> so again, this uh, Koch curve, if you see, eh, this uh, has the self-similarity feature. Here, I mean, if you can uh, calculate the, the perimeter of uh, this length of this uh, Koch curve, it will turn out to be eh, infinite because you see that the length is increasing by a constant factor. Initially, it was length 1, then 4 by 3, then it will be 4 by 3 squared, and so on. So this will have infinite length. And also, this curve, uh, one can prove that it is a no different, nowhere differentiable curve, but it is continuous. So oh, this uh, has self-similarity feature. This is made up of for four pieces and each scaled by a factor of one by three. So I would like you to remember these uh, examples. So, so these are uh, certain examples of what are known as self-similar similar fractals. Uh, so now let us come to some like mathematical definitions. So first I'll define what is known as uh, Hausdorff measure and the Hausdorff for dimension. So, so this uh, in fact can be done for a general metric space. Uh, uh, if you want, you can restrict to Euclidean space Rn, but let, let me define it for general metric space. So suppose uh, we have XD is a metric space and A is any subset of X. Now for any positive delta, 
and non-negative real number s, we, we will define what is known as uh, hs delta. So this uh, hs delta of a, this is defined as infimum of, uh, we look at uh, all delta covers of this set a. So what is the delta cover? Delta cover means that uh, we look at uh, countable collection a k whose union contains this set a. So a is contained in union of uh, a k and diameter of each a k is strictly less than delta. Okay, so <laughs> and then we, we look at the sum of diameter of these sets a k raised to power s and the this say, infimum we define to be equal to h s delta of a of course this infimum can be equal to infinite also so it can be finite or it can be infinite so oh, one one can check that uh, this uh, h s delta this defines an outer measure on the metric space x so i i hope that uh, you know what is the meaning of outer measure. So outer measure simply means that uh, <coughs> it is co countably sub-additive. So if you look at countable union of uh, uh, sets, then the outer measure is less than equal to the countable sum of the measures of each of them. And uh, for empty set, it is equal to zero and also oh, it satisfies monotonicity. So if A is subset of B, then the HS delta of A will be less than equal to HS delta of B. So oh, this is an outer measure. And also note that if we look at this map, if we change delta, suppose S is fixed and I change delta, then as delta decreases, hs delta will increase so this delta going to hs delta of a this is a decreasing function if you increase delta then hs delta will uh, decrease that is because uh, uh, you take the infimum over the uh, so oh, if my e delta 1 is less than delta 2 then any e delta 1 cover will also be delta 2 cover but need not be the other way. So by taking infimum over a larger collection, you may get a smaller value. So this is decreasing and the, therefore, the, we can talk about limit of this HS delta of A as delta approaches zero from the right. So this right hand limit, this is actually equal to the supremum because this, uh, as delta decreases, this is increasing. So we can define this to be also equal to supremum of uh, HS. Uh, this sigma should be S. So this uh, HS delta of A for delta positive. And this we define to be equal to HS of A. And then one can check that this HS say, is a Borel measure. And this will be called the S dimensional Hausdorff measure. So this is the a, uh, s dimensional Hausdorff measure. So for any non-negative integer, uh, not integer, for any non-negative real number s, we can define s dimensional Hausdorff measure. You can compare this uh, with the Lebesgue measure. So when we, we look at Lebesgue measure, uh, suppose I a, am on R, then the Lebesgue measure, the way we define it, we look at the summation of length of uh, intervals ik and where the a is contained in union of ik and take the infimum of that. That defines the, the Lebesgue measure, the one dimensional in R, the Lebesgue measure of a subset of real number is defined like that. So in that case, you can see that uh, the length of interval is same as diameter of uh, that uh, interval. So so in, in fact, if you look at s equal to 1, then h1 of a will be same as the Lebesgue measure l1 of a. And if you are in two dimension or the n dimension, then
this uh, it, it can be shown that the, the n dimensional hausdorff measure is a constant multiple of the n dimensional lebesgue measure so no, that is something which is true but here uh, now we are defining this for the non integer also so this is defined for any s and uh, the, this is not only a borel measure this is also a metric measure which means that if you take two subsets a and b such that distance between a and b is uh, strictly positive then hs of a union b will be equal to hs of a plus hs of b so a and b need not be disjoint but if the distance between them is the okay so uh, so now well, using this hausdorff measure the, we define hausdorff dimension of a subset of metric space so the hausdorff dimension so using this hausdorff measure the, uh, we can prove that there is a unique uh, non negative real number s not such that if you take any s less than s not then hs of a will be equal to infinity and hs of a is equal to 0 for s bigger than s not so this means that this s not is the cutoff value where the hausdorff measure jumps from infinity to 0 so this number s not this is called the hausdorff dimension of a so for example if you see in this definition if my a is any infinite set and if i take uh, s to be equal to 0 then uh, h0 of a will be equal to infinity so that is just the counting measure the h0 just gives the counting measure so that gives the cardinality of uh, the set so <coughs> so for s equal to 0 it is infinity it may remain infinity for uh, up to some value and then suddenly it jumps from infinity to zero so oh, this number is called the hausdorff dimension so one can also define now the hausdorff dimension as the infimum of all those s such that hs of a equal to infinity that is this s not and it is sorry it is this a supremum of all the s such that hs a equal to infinity and that it can be defined also as infimum of all those s such that hs of a is equal to 0 so you look at the infimum of all such that the s dimensional hausdorff measure is 0 that gives the dimension or you can look at the supremum for all where uh, this hs of a is equal to infinity and at this point s not the value of uh, hs not of a it may be e finite and uh, non zero or it can be infinity or it can be zero so one can find example where there any of these things happen but uh, the interesting examples are when like uh, hs not of a is finite and non zero so it is strictly between zero and infinity then uh, so that that is true for most of these uh, like uh, fractals that uh, we, we discuss so okay so i wanted to like uh, tell some properties of this uh, hausdorff measure and dimension so oh, one thing is uh, uh, very important property is the scaling property so suppose i take this uh, set a uh, let, let us now consider uh, that uh, this uh, x is uh, the euclidean space rn and a is any subset of rn then uh, suppose i scale this set a so if i take a constant multiple of a c times a then what is hs of c times a so you can see that uh, hs of c times a will be nothing but c to the s times hs of a because when you use this definition uh, if a is contained in union of ak then c times a will be contained in union of c times ak and diameter of c times ak will be c times diameter ak so in this sum c to the s uh, will come out 
and then so oh you can see that if a set is scaled by a constant multiple c then hs of c times a will be equal to c to the s times hs of a and <coughs> the hausdorff dimension okay so yeah so oh, that that is the scaling property e, and the, yeah for the hausdorff dimension one important thing is that this is by lipschitz invariant so if you have a, a by lipschitz map it means that if you have a map from f f from x to x such that f is lipschitz and its inverse f inverse is also lipschitz or that is equivalent to saying that uh, if you look at the distance between f of uh, x and f of y then that is less than equal to some constant times distance between uh, x and y and it is greater than equal to some positive constant times distance between x and y then in that case uh, the a hausdorff dimension of the image f of a if you look at that will be same as the hausdorff dimension of a so hausdorff dimension is invariant under read this uh, uh, by lipschitz transformation uh, also oh, oh, like uh, hausdorff dimension uh, this is a monotonic uh, function so oh, if you look at uh, uh, suppose a is subset of b then the a hausdorff dimension of a must be less than equal to hausdorff dimension of b again that is not difficult to prove and uh, one other important property of this hausdorff dimension is that it is countably stable which means that uh, if you look at uh, countable union of sets then its hausdorff dimension is equal to supremum of the hausdorff dimension of each of those sets so hausdorff dimension of countable union of ai will be equal to supremum of dimension of ai I and mean, one one way is easy that uh, because of monotonicity is dimension of each ai will be less than equal to dimension of union of ai and therefore supremum will also be less than equal to and the other way also can be proved using this uh, hausdorff measure and this definition of dimension so or oh, this countable stability this uh, uh, shows that uh, the hausdorff dimension of any countable set will be equal to zero because if you take singleton then its hausdorff dimension uh, clearly is, is equal to zero so for any countable set the hausdorff dimension is equal to zero and <coughs> therefore for example if you look at uh, the unit interval and look at all the rationals in the unit interval then its uh, uh, hausdorff dimension will be equal to zero even though rationals are dense in uh, the unit interval so oh, hausdorff dimension this also shows that it does not satisfy that hausdorff dimension of the closure of a set need not be equal to the hausdorff dimension of the set because the hausdorff dimension of the unit interval is equal to 1 but the hausdorff dimension of uh, rationals in the unit interval which is dense in that that uh, will be equal to 0 also oh, if you have any subset of rn then its hausdorff dimension must be less than equal to n so it can be zero up to n it cannot be more than n so oh, that again is not difficult to show one can show that the hausdorff dimension of the unit cube is equal to n and then uh, by monotonicity uh, one can see that uh, for any set the hausdorff dimension will be less than equal to n so th these are some properties we would like to know the hausdorff dimension of the fractals for example this uh, uh, cantor set sierpinski triangle etc so okay <coughs> so oh, maybe let me in, in say about the cantor set so cantor set if you see what we he said that the cantor set if i denote it by f f is equal to f1 union f2 where f1 is f intersected with the interval 0 to 1 by 3 and f2 is f intersected with the interval 2 1 by 
two thread to one. So, oh, and each of them you see is uh, just a map image under a similarity transformation where the ratio, this contraction ratio is one by three. So, oh, if you look at HS of F, HS of F because F1 and F2 are disjoint will be equal to HS of F1 plus HS of F2. That is just by the property of measure. And what is HS of F1 by the similarity property? We know that HS of F1 will be equal to C to the power S times HS of F, F where C is that uh, scaling factor. So the scaling factor for the uh, Cantor set is one by three. So HS of F will be equal to one by three to the S HS of F plus the other one is again uh, that same my scaling factor, just it is translated also. So oh, we'll get one by three to the S HS of F plus one by three to the S HS of F. So, I mean, uh, the is a heuristic way to calculate the uh, host of dimension of the Cantor set. So oh, suppose we assume that the, uh, suppose the S naught is the host of dimension of the Cantor set. And if we assume that the HS of S naught is positive and finite, then uh, by putting that in this equation, we'll get HS H S naught of F is equal to one by three times H S naught of F plus one by three e to the S times H S naught of F. And if we assume that H S naught of F is non-zero and finite, then we can cancel that and we'll get one by three to the S plus one by three to the S is equal to one. And that gives the value of the Hausdorff dimension S naught is equal to log two by log three. Of course, this is not uh, very rigorous because uh, uh, we have to uh, like justify why the Hausdorff measure in that dimension is uh, non-zero and finite. So. So yeah, this screen I was like planning to like show the calculation here, but uh, uh, because I'm not able to like share the screen from my iPad, so I'm not able to write. So uh, now uh, let me talk about other dimension, which uh, uh, is known as the box counting dimension. So. This box counting dimension actually is much simpler to understand than Hausdorff dimension. So <laughs> let, let me just first explain motivation for this. So suppose we take a, a square in R2. So if we look at uh, uh, this square and suppose we have a square of uh, uh, side length is one and then uh, or say diameter one and then if I e, e want to take uh, diameter half and then how many e, what is the smallest number of sets of diameter half which can cover uh, the square of diameter one. So you can clearly divide this square into two, four uh, squares, each of diameter, half of the original one. So oh, if I take this delta equal to half, then the number, this n delta f, so, so oh, let, let me uh, say what this is. So what we will do for any non-empty bounded subset of Rn, F is any non-empty bounded subset. And for any positive delta, we define N delta F to be the smallest number of sets of diameter at most delta, which can cover F. Right? So this is the least number of sets of diameter less than or equal to delta, such that F is union of those many sets. 
so note that uh, because we are taking this bounded set so this n delta f will be finite right otherwise uh, i mean this can be equal to infinity also so we have taken non empty and bounded so that we ensure that this n delta f is a finite uh, number so oh, for the uh, case of uh, square uh, i was saying that if you take delta equal to oh, half then n delta of uh, the square will be equal to half square uh, sorry two square so you need four uh, sets of diameter half which can cover the uh, square of diameter 1 if you take delta to be equal to say 1 by 3 then uh, you, you your n delta of f will be equal to 3 square so you need nine sets of diameter at most three to cover the square so oh, what we can see is that uh, this n delta f is like proportional to oh, 1 by delta squared for the case of uh, in r2 when we are taking for a square so oh, and this 2 that we are getting the exponent n delta f is equal to this 1 by delta raised to power 2 that 2 is what is uh, we know or the dimension of this is solid square right so so therefore what we, we, we like uh, are trying to generalize that thing and define uh, what is known as box counting dimension so this box counting dimension we want to define as limit of log of n delta f by minus log delta that means uh, this denominator you can see as log of 1 by delta so oh, oh you, you can see the example for the square that i was saying that if you would see n delta f is some constant times uh, 1 by delta raised to power 2 then in that case if you take log both sides and then take this limit then you will get equal to 2 now the problem is that the limit of log n delta f by minus log delta this may not exist so what we do we define the limit inferior and limit superior so the lower box counting dimension is defined as the limit of delta approaching zero of log n delta f by minus log delta and the upper box counting dimension is defined as the limit sup of that and if uh, the limit exists which means that if uh, this uh, lower box counting dimension and upper box counting dimension if they are equal then we will denote uh, this limit the common value be the box counting dimension so if they are both equal then we refer the common value as the box counting dimension of f so again for the cantor set uh, one can uh, prove that the lower box counting dimension and upper box counting dimension are both equal to log 2 by log 3 so that uh, is fractal dimension for this uh, if we consider the box counting dimension we get log 2 by log 3 hausdorff dimension also can be proved to be equal to log 2 by log 3 i gave heuristic argument but uh, one can prove it rigorously also and <coughs> again what are some properties of uh, this uh, box counting dimension so both the lower box counting dimension and upper box counting dimension these are monotonic and for any uh, subset of rn it will be between 0 to n it cannot be more than n uh, also oh, these are by lipschitz invariant so under by lipschitz map the image will have this uh, same box counting dimension as the set uh, now let's uh, look at uh, okay one more property which is easy to see is that uh, if we look at f and f closer then the lower and upper box counting dimension of f will be equal to uh, the dimension of its closer because so you see n delta f and n delta f closer will be same 
so this is something different from hausdorff dimension for hausdorff dimension the dimension of uh, hausdorff dimension of f need not be equal to hausdorff dimension of f closer but here the hausdorff uh, the box counting dimension of f and f closer are equal so if you look at uh, the rationals in the unit interval then the box counting dimension will be equal to 1 even though it is countable so this box counting dimension this is not countably stable like for countable union uh, the box counting dimension need not be equal to the supremum of the dimension because for any singleton of course or for any finite set you can prove that the box counting dimension is equal to 0 but the upper box counting dimension it is finitely stable which means that uh, if i take uh, union of finitely many sets f1 f2 fk then the upper box counting dimension of that finite union will be equal to maximum of the upper box counting dimension of the union however for the lower box counting dimension it is not even finitely stable so one can construct example where of two sets f1 and f2 such that lower box counting dimension of f1 union f2 is strictly bigger than the e maximum of the lower box counting dimension of f1 and f2 both so so this is something that uh, the box counting dimension uh, it does not satisfy this uh, countable stability and that is uh, like one reason that this is not uh, as important as the hausdorff dimension but uh, the advantage is that uh, like estimating the box counting dimension is uh, easier because say, here you can like estimate uh, this uh, thing and uh, one one can uh, find bonds for the box counting dimension that is much easier than in general finding the uh, estimating the hausdorff dimension let me define one more uh, fractal dimension which is known as the packing dimension so so packing dimension uh, first we define for any non negative s and any positive delta ps delta of f so this definition you can see is uh, analogous to what we did for uh, the hausdorff uh, measure so oh, this is we are taking supremum of summation of diameter of bi to the power s where bi is a collection of disjoint balls uh, sorry it has not come completely so this is a collection of disjoint balls of radii at most delta which cover this set f so we look at so here note that we are only considering balls not a general set so balls of radii at most delta which cover f and then we are looking at summation diameter bi to the s and looking at the supremum so oh, this we define as ps delta of f this ps delta uh, this uh, need not be an outer measure but uh, this uh, ps delta of f this decreases with delta so this is also oh, oh, this limit as delta approaches zero this exists and we define this to be equal to p0 of f this p0 again uh, this uh, need not be a measure because uh, for a countable set this p0 of uh, countable set need not be equal to 0 so what we do is we define a measure using this p0 so we define this p s of f this is infimum over all uh we look at all covers countable cover fi and then we look at the infimum of summation of ps0 of fi for i equal to 1 to infinity and this we define as psf so this psf turns out to be an outer measure and this is called the s dimensional packing measure 
uh, s dimensional packing measure just like we define s dimensional hausdorff measure one can define this s dimensional packing measure by using this uh, definition and then the just like hausdorff dimension the packing dimension can be defined as so uh, again one can show that uh, this uh, supremum of s says that psf is equal to infinity is same as infimum of s where psf is equal to 0 and this common value is defined as the packing dimension of f so packing dimension of f is defined like this and uh, when one can get uh, a relation between these three dimensions that i have defined so hausdorff dimension is the smallest one hausdorff dimension of any f is always less than or equal to the packing dimension of f and packing dimension of uh, uh, f is less than or equal to the upper box counting dimension so upper box counting dimension is the maximum and this packing dimension but uh, we need not have equality so there are examples where like hausdorff dimension is strictly less than packing dimension and packing dimension is strictly less than the box counting upper box counting dimension so <laughs> So that is uh, something about uh, uh, this fractal dimension. There are other kind of fractal dimension also which have been introduced, but uh, I'll not go into all those things. Uh, next, uh, let me uh, talk about uh, iterated function system. So for that, uh, let me first define what is known as Hausdorff metric. So we start with a complete metric space XD and then uh, if we have any subset a of x and we have any point uh, small x in x we can define the distance of this point x to this subset a this is uh, simply the infimum over distance between x to a where x varies over all the points in the set a so this is the distance of a point to a set right? and then we'll define what is known as delta neighborhood of set A. So if A is any subset and delta is positive, we define N delta of A. This is called the delta neighborhood of A. This is all X in X such that the distance of X to A is less than delta. For example, like if, if I consider a disk in R2 and then what is this delta neighborhood? Delta neighborhood will mean that you look at all the points whose distance from this disk is less than delta. So that will be open disk of radius you increase by delta. Suppose you have a disk of radius r, then you take a, a concentric disk of radius r plus delta. That will be the delta neighborhood of uh, that disk. So we define delta neighborhood of a set. And then we can define Hausdorff metric, distance between two subsets. So if we have A and B are two non-empty compact subsets of X, then we define the distance between A and B be equal to infimum of all those delta such that A is contained in delta neighborhood of B and B is contained in delta neighborhood of A. Right? So this is the distance between A and B. Uh, you can note why like instead of compact set i can take uh, uh, non empty closed and bounded sets and on that also we can define so we can define this uh, metric on a bigger uh, collection also but uh, here i am taking non empty and compact subsets so non empty of course we are taking because otherwise uh, uh, this uh, distance can be infinite and uh, again uh, bounded is needed because uh, otherwise there may not be any delta suppose i take uh, an unbounded set and one set which is bounded then any delta neighborhood of bounded set cannot cover the unbounded sets right so oh, therefore the uh, this uh, distance between a and b can turn out to be infinity but we want to define a metric so for any two points, we want that the distance would be a finite. Right? Uh, again, uh, like uh, 
why closed is important because uh, uh, if i look at the distance between a and a closer then that will be equal to zero because i mean a is contained in a closer so any delta neighborhood of a closer of course covers a and any delta neighborhood of a will cover a closer also so this infimum of delta such that this happens this will turn out to be zero so but if a and a closer are not equal then we uh, the, uh, don't get metric because distance between two dif distinct point is equal to zero so that is the reason why one considers non empty closed and bounded subset or non empty compact subsets if you consider then this will become a metric so so we denote this k of x to be the collection of all non empty compact subsets of uh, this would be x of x and then this function that i have defined this d this is a metric on this uh, uh, set k of x so this kx comma d this becomes a metric space and this metric d is called the hausdorff metric so given a complete metric space i mean one can do this for any metric space one doesn't need com completeness for this then you get a metric space on the collection of all non empty compact subsets or you can do this on non empty closed and bounded subsets also now one important thing is that if my original space is complete then this space k of x with the hausdorff metric is also complete by the way completeness means that every cosy sequence in that uh, space converges to a point in that so so if xd is a complete metric space then kx with the hausdorff matrix capital d this is also a complete matrix space so this is uh, just the definition of hausdorff matrix now we'll use this to like uh, discuss it. so let's uh, define what is known as iterated function system so suppose i have xd is a complete matrix space and theta i from x to x these are contraction mappings so contraction maps means that uh, there exists some uh, constant r i less than 1 such that distance between theta i x and theta i y is less than equal to r i times distance between x y for all x y and x so these are contraction maps or these are lipschitz map with the lipschitz constant strictly less than 1 so they are finitely many contraction maps on a complete metric space so this system will be called an iterated function system so a complete metric space x together with finitely many contraction maps this is called iterated function system in short we will call this ifs I mean one can do this for countable collection also but uh, we restrict it to finite ifs only so a non empty compact subset a of x this will be called an attractor or invariant set for this given ifs if a is equal to union of theta i of a for i equal to 1 to n so if this a is made up of this finite union of images of for a under these uh, contraction maps theta i then we'll call this compact non empty set to be an attractor so now i mean the, the first question is that given ifs can we guarantee that it always has an attractor and if it has is it unique so that is true so this is uh, just an application of banach fixed point theorem or contraction mapping principle which will give the existence of a unique attractor for a given ifs so, so let me just uh, sketch a proof for how this is done so what what you do is that uh, you can define a map so if i take any subset uh, f of x Then you define a map, say capital theta, which maps f to union of theta i of f. And 
what, what is the uh, space where you are considering this map so consider this k of x so this we defined in this right so k x was the collection of all non empty compact subsets on x so on this space you map any non empty compact subset to union of this theta i of f so of course if uh, uh, these maps are contraction maps they are continuous and the continuous image of compact set is compact so theta i of f will be compact for each i and then we are taking finite union so that will be compact so it will map kx to kx so i get a self map on k of x and if you look at uh, this uh, hausdorff metric on d then distance between capital theta of uh, f1 and f2 that will be less than equal to r times distance between f1 and f2 where r can be taken to be equal to the maximum of these ri's so because each ri is less than 1 r is also less than 1 so what you will get you will get a contraction map on the complete metric space k of x and then by the banach fixed point theorem it must have a unique fixed point so that fixed point is say a then a will be equal to capital theta of a which means that a is equal to union of theta i of a i1 to n so that gives the unique attractor so only thing needed is here is contraction maps and the space should be complete metric space in particular if we take euclidean space rn and contraction maps then we will get attractor so okay again uh, uh, you can uh, now oh, see the examples that we discussed in the beginning so so look at the cantor set so for cantor set it can be described as attractor for an ifs so you take x to be equal to say the unit interval 0 1 and then you take two maps theta 1 and theta 2 where theta 1 of x is equal to one third of x and theta 2 of x is one third x plus two third and then it is easy to check that uh, uh, so each of theta 1 and theta 2 these are contraction maps with uh, r1 r2 equal to 1 by 3 in fact in that case we have this equality so it is contracting similarity we get and the the cantor set is nothing but attractor for that ifs so similarly if we consider the sierpinski triangle then we can take x to be the original equilateral triangle and on that we can take three maps theta 1 theta 2 theta 3 where theta 1 maps the bigger triangle to one of the uh, triangle of uh, diameter half and theta 2 maps to the other one and theta 3 to the third one so again the sierpinski triangle is nothing but attractor for the ifs given by these three maps theta 1 theta 2 theta 3 and similarly for koch curve you will get uh, four maps and for each of them this uh, ratio contractive ratio will be equal to 1 by 3 so <laughs> so all all these examples are actually not just uh, uh, contraction map this is contracting the uh, similar similarity so we define a map to be a similitude if there exists a constant r less than 1 such that distance between theta x and theta y is equal to this constant r times distance between x and y so note that for the contraction map we had less than equal to here we require equal to so oh, this is called similarity and if we have uh, any ifs where each theta i is a similitude then it's a attractor it's called a self similar fractal right so oh, for the we saw the example cantor set sierpinski triangle and koch curve those are examples of self similar fractals and 
the its similarity dimension is given by the unique s for which summation of ri to the s is equal to 1 so for the case of the cantor set we have two maps and r1 and r2 are both equal to 1 by 3 so it will be 1 by 3 to the s plus 1 by 3 to the s is equal to 1 which will give s is equal to log 2 by log 3 for the sierpinski triangle the similarity dimension if you want to cal calculate we have r1 r2 r3 each are equal each equal to 1 by 2 so we get 3 times 1 by 2 to the s is equal to 1 and that gives s is equal to log 3 by log 2 so that log 3 by log 2 is the similarity dimension for sierpinski triangle and for the koch curve we have four maps and r1 r2 r3 r4 are all equal to 1 by 3 so we'll get 4 times 1 by 3 to the s is equal to 1 that will give s is equal to log 4 by log 3 so these these are the, the similarity dimension And these are also equal to the fractal dimension that we have were discussed. So, so for Cantor set, Sierpinski gasket, and Koch curve, one can show that the similarity dimension can be calculated easily. Now, oh, we'll discuss about the Hausdorff dimension of the attractor. So, in 1981, Hutchinson uh, he, he gave a result. that if we have a finite ifs on the, the euclidean space rn and suppose that each of these theta i is a similitude or similarity transformation and it satisfies uh, some disjointness condition which is known as uh, the open set condition then in that case the the hausdorff dimension of uh, this uh, attractor is equal to its similarity dimension so there is this technical condition which is required this open set condition otherwise in general this is not true and also it is important that uh, the space is an euclidean space so this result is not true in general complete metric space so here we require the space to be finite dimensional also so this rn is needed and uh, this open set condition basically says that uh, there exists some open set such that uh, uh, open set call uh, it to be equal to v such that uh, uh, this theta i of v these are disjoint so theta i v intersection theta j of v is empty if i is not equal to j and union of theta i of v is contained in v so that that is something which is needed uh, let let me not go into that so there is some disjointness condition which is required to prove that and in fact uh, he also showed that in this case the box dimension box counting dimension is also equal to the similarity dimension further the hausdorff measure in this dimension is strictly positive and finite so those things are all true for all these uh, examples that we have considered so we can calculate the hausdorff dimension of cantor set koch curve sierpinski gasket very easily because the similarity dimension we can calculate easily so but uh, in in general uh, calculating uh, hausdorff dimension is not easy and there there are examples uh, of uh, subsets of real numbers whose continued fraction expansion has the some particular digits and in that case so we get uh, this thing as attractor for some ifs but uh, the maps are not similitudes so in that case uh, this result is not applicable so in that case uh, it is the little more difficult to estimate the hausdorff dimension but uh, it, it has been done for these examples also using some other techniques so so that is uh, something about uh, the hausdorff dimension of attractor for ifs okay so i think uh, uh, i'll now give some references so mostly i have like mentioned the books here 
so oh, there is this book by e. michael barnsley title is fractals everywhere so in this uh, you can find uh, about this hausdorff meser dimension box counting dimension and iterated function system everything can be found here uh, this uh, the main reference uh, i would say is like uh, uh, this falconer kenneth falconer fractal geometry number 6 this is a book uh, consider like uh, all these topics uh, that i have discussed and many other things are there so this uh, there is also a, a a very short book this is also by falconer fractals a very short introduction so there is this uh, short introduction series of books by oxford university press in that uh, he wrote uh, this book fractals a very short introduction so this is for someone who like want to quickly like uh, see an introduction to fractals one can look at this book and the, of course uh, there are like two more books i have listed by falconer one is this geometry of fractal sets cambridge university press so this uh, talks about many other like uh, geometric measure theory aspect and there is this book uh, techniques in fractal geometry which has uh, some other like uh, relatively recent things uh, in fractal geometry and there is also springer's this undergraduate text in mathematics the title of the book is measure topology and fractal geometry by gerald edgar so there also you can find many of these things so uh all all these fractals you can uh, see that the examples that we have discussed relatively easy to uh, like uh, describe and uh, like uh, construct but uh, it cannot be like uh, studied using the classical geometry so there is like geometric measure theory is uh, an area where like uh, one studies about uh, these kind of sets uh yeah there is also this uh, number 8 is the classical book uh, the fractal geometry of nature by benoit mandelbrot so this was probably one of the first uh, like thing here and he gives many examples of uh, fractals from nature also so many thing like trees if you see it has branches and then this thing so oh, they are like uh, fractal like Uh, things uh, occurs like the coastline and then clouds and many things like this scotch curve also there's something called snowflakes scotch snowflakes curve so oh they are like natural objects which uh, are like fractals so oh, you, you can get many like uh, examples there and number 9 this is again a book by matilla geometry of sets and measures in euclidean spaces here you can find more about like how to this this book and this uh, seventh is a paper by hutchinson fractals and self similarity where first uh, he like uh, proved that result where under open set condition the fractal the hausdorff dimension is equal to the is similarity dimension so so i'll stop here